Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Lorenz, and I am from the PAVE program at Cary. I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, while we are trying to uh, get our webinar up and running, we had some difficulties um, getting our connections. Um, I just ask that if you are able to um, mute yourselves during the presentation, um, that would be uh, appreciated. Um, if you're just dialing in, I believe you're able to mute by just um, hitting star seven. Um, so as I said, I'm Mario Lorenz. Before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we request that all questions be submitted into the chat. You should see that in the lower left-hand screen. Um, and so you should be able so you should be able to um, put your questions in there and we will uh, put time aside. So you try to address all the questions that you have. The conference is now in listen-only mode. So um, as I was saying, we'll try to address your uh, questions at that time. Also, we will be having a, um, we will be having a recording of this webinar um, coming out in the next day or two. So if, um, as I said, because we were delayed starting and you were had to leave early or miss it, or if you wanted to share this with some of your colleagues, then uh, that will be made available to you in the next day or two. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. So, um, so I just want to share. Also joining me today is uh, Katie Maurer and from Cari, and uh, Katie Maurer and Shannon Graham are actually uh, advocates assisting through the restorative justice process. Um, and Sue Wasserkrug, who is from our partner at Good Shepherd Mediation. We're looking forward to sharing with you information about both of our organizations. Uh, if you're not familiar with, if you're not familiar with either of us, um, this will, uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear from both of our organizations. You'll also have an opportunity to hear about the theory and practice regarding restorative justice, and then how this program works to assist older adults in addressing harm caused to them. So um, with that information, I will begin. So just wanted to share a little bit with you about CARI. Um, so CARI stands for the Center for Advocacy for the Rights and Interests of the Elderly. We are a, a nonprofit organization that both focuses on older adults. This is our 43 year, 43rd year in, of being in existence. And the, physically, we are located in Center City, Philadelphia um, as Though, as I'm sure many of you who are also experiencing were, even though um, we are not in our physical offices, we are still doing our work remotely. So advocates and staff, um, we are working from home, um, providing the services that we provide and continue to be those voice, voices for, for older adults, um, certainly a time more needed now than, than ever. And uh, so we have a number of different programs and the programs that, that I really want to focus a little bit more on the PACE program because that's where the restorative justice program um, is, is sort of came, is born out of. So uh, PACE stands for Providing Advocacy for Victimized Elders. It's a victim assistance service program um, focused on older adults. And we provide a variety of services to um, elders who've been a victim of a crime. And these services can include assisting with victim compensation assistance. It can also be assistance for securing um, doors and repairing windows that have um, been broken and need to be secured because of a crime. Uh, we also um, have short-term counseling uh, available and we have some other um, we have other services related to court accompaniment and 
court, helping to coordinate transportation to court, notifying individuals of, of court dates they have to attend to. Uh, with the courts right now, the civil, excuse me, with criminal and um, jury trials being suspended, we are currently uh, not going to court, but we have been supporting older adults who've been victims of crime. Um, we have a lot of amazing partners that we work with, some of you who are on this call with us, and um, we're still um, being made aware of those individuals who, who need our assistance and making sure that we um, get that assistance to them. And uh, one of the things that I think that makes CARI unique is that we have a lot of, um, we have um, a lot of programs that work with individuals. So for example, um, with the PAY program, it's a, it's a lot of work, it's working with individuals. With the Ombudsman program that in Philadelphia, which is advocating for individuals in nursing facilities and, and personal care homes, long-term care facilities, it's a lot of individual work. Senior Medicare Patrol, again, it's a lot of education and working with individuals who had been um, potentially um, either a victim of fraud, Medicare fraud, and Carrie Line. I mean, Carrie, I can't believe I forgot Carrie Line. Carrie Line is our flagship program where anyone can call and if they need assistance with an older adult or someone related to an older adult or could be a neighbor, a professional, whomever, they can get assistance from a, an, an advocate and assisting them. And so we do a lot of individual work and it's, and we are sort of, I like to say we meet people where they are and that assistance that they need, but that individual work it can sort of transfer to policy work um, and making sure that we're advocating on a systematic level as well. We certainly have been doing that quite often, more often now than ever um, with COVID and advocating for individuals in nursing facilities. So we've, we've um, done a great deal of that in advocating uh, in, on a, like I said, on that systematic level. So that is a little bit about um, just the overall what we do at CARI. And I'm going to now uh, and I will let Sue. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Sue. Okay, good, because <laughs> I just figured out how to unmute myself. Um, great, thanks. Um, so my name is Sue Wasserkrug. I'm from Good Shepherd Mediation Program. Um, we are a very small nonprofit in Philadelphia. We're a community justice center. Um, we Basically, our mission is to just encourage people to um, resolve their conflicts um, on their own without having to go to court. We, we encourage peace, reconciliation, and social justice. Um, we've been around since 1984. We were founded by a, um, a nun, an order of, of nuns, but our work is completely um, secular and independent. We don't, you know, nothing that we do is um, religious in nature other than our name. Uh, we have a wide range of programs, including um, mediation and facilitation for individuals and groups. Um, we do restorative practices, which um, we'll, we'll, you'll hear about in just a minute. And then we also do a wide range of training and consulting programs. And let's see, I think that's it for me. Um, okay. I'm going to mute myself again and turn it over to, I think, Katie.
Okay. Uh, I'm hoping you can hear me. I think I unmuted myself. Um, can someone let me know if you can hear me? Um, so I am great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so now I guess I'll let you know a little bit about restorative justice. Um, restorative justice, as the slide sort of indicates, it's just a process um, to look at a, a, a crime or a harm that's occurred and to involve the people that were affected um, in resolving the problem and healing the harm. Um, Howard Zare, as it shows you there at the very bottom, um, wrote sort of the classic little book of restorative justice. Um, and as you can see, his definition there is that it's a process to involve those who have a stake in the offense and to collectively identify and address harms, needs, and obligations. So it, it's, you know, as I said, the main thing is it's a way to um, look at the harm that's occurred and, and heal whatever harm has happened in a way that allows all of those affected to move forward in a positive way. Okay, let's see. Um, and here's just sort of a, 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 a comparison of uh, restorative justice as opposed to retributive justice, which is what our um, system in the United States is. And retributive justice, Retributive justice um, crime is sort of seen as an act against the state. Um, you know, it's a violation of the law. But in restorative justice, we think of crime as an offense or a violation against someone or or a community or you know a relationship, something like that. Um, in criminal justice, it's about you know controlling the crime, punishing someone. In restorative justice, it's more about having the community take control over what happens um, moving forward. And then, you know, as I said, in, in retributive justice, the offender um, is punished. And in restorative justice, accountability is more a matter of taking responsibility and taking action to, to repair whatever harm has, been, occur, has occurred as a result of the offense. Um, and in restorative justice, crime is seen as, as affecting more than just an individual, which is often the case in retributive justice, but as, as affecting a whole, a whole group or social group or, or community. Um, then as far as punishment, you know, restorative justice practitioners don't presume that restorative justice is a, is a um, replacement for punishment, but rather that it can be effective in helping communities and families and relationships, you know, to move forward so that the, so that the offense doesn't occur again. And then, you know, anybody who's ever been involved with our criminal legal system probably knows victims sometimes are not really involved in, um, except to testify. Um, whereas in restorative justice, victims are much more central in, um, in resolving the situation. Okay, let's see. Okay, I think this is me, actually, so I'll just continue. Um, in practice, okay, so that was all very theoretical. In practice, what are we doing? We're sitting down with people. We're having a conversation, a facilitated meeting, or sometimes more than one meeting, with the people who've been, effect who've been affected, the offenders, the victims, and anyone else who's been, sometimes anyone else who's been affected um, by the offense. So there are sort of three um, main categories of restorative justice. The first, I'm going to actually start with the middle one, Victim Offender Conference. That's, as the name implies, it's a situation where you bring together a victim and an offender. It's usually just two people 
there may be more people. Um, to sit down, and, and the thing that I should say about all of these uh, processes is there's always a, some sort of a facilitator involved in, in directing the process. So in a victim offender conference, it's the victim, the offender, and the facilitator who, who guides the conversation between the two parties to look at um, you know, what happened, how can we avoid it happening again? What was the effect on the on the individuals, um, and and what can be done to move forward in a positive way to heal the the person who was offended um, or the victim, and to move forward in a positive way to heal the damage. And then the then going to the left, the family group conference is usually just a larger group of people affected by the crime. It doesn't have to literally be a family. It can be a community. Um, there can be other support people involved, especially when you're dealing with older adults. There might be caregivers, um, community, you know, neighbors, support persons. Um, and so it in involves all of these people in deciding how to resolve the da the crime and how to how to again heal the damage, um, and usually it starts off with the um, offender. But you know, as it indicates here, it's sort of looking at what are the strengths that we can draw on to reach a solution. And then the last one that I'll talk about is the circle process. That's just a really structured. Um, conversation where, as the name implies, you know, people sort of go around in a circle and talk about how the situation affected them. And again, trying to, to come up with, with ways to move forward. One of the key things about all of these processes is that what I always like to tell people is it's an opportunity for you to be heard and also for you to hear from the other parties. So let me, let's see, I think, let me move the slide forward. And hopefully somebody else can take over from here. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is Katie. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how, um, just kind of how the program works, particularly from the Carrie side of things. Um, so yeah, so like we talked about a little bit earlier, um, so Carrie and this program in general, we focus on um, older adults over the age of 60 who are um, victims of some kind of harm. Um, so we're aiming to address cases that would normally fall through the cracks, um, and that means a lot of different things, but you know, it could be where seniors don't want to go through the criminal justice system, or they may not really feel comfortable um, with different aspects of it, but they still need some type of environment to address the harm that occurred. Um, so if, you know, in y'all's work, if you come across any older adults that share concerns, um, that, you know, that maybe they could benefit from what you've been hearing from our webinar, that they could benefit from an RJ process, um, you know, we at CARI, um, you know, I'm going to go to the next no, I'm not going to go to the next slide. Um, so we at Cary would take the referral from you, um, and then we'd reach out to the senior to further, you know, find out if the situation, find out about the situation, um, what's going on with them, um, and then we, you know, we'd further explain the program in full. Um, I think partly because restorative justice is such a different idea, you know, you need like kind of different layers of of learning about what it is and 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 if it makes sense for the situation. So if it's appropriate for restorative justice, we would then refer older, the older adult over to Good Shepherd, and, um, and Sue would kind of take over there where um, you know, Good Shepherd has their own kind of screening process and then would just further explain the details of the meetings to the victim. Um, and then from there, Good Shepherd would also reach out to the offending party separately to hear their side of things and any other parties that should be involved as well. Um, and then work with both or all parties to determine if restorative justice is needed, how many meetings need to occur, things like that. And then Carrie, so the restorative justice advocates, which would be me and then Shannon, who had some tech issues, so she's not on the call right now. Um, the two of us would act, you know, one, one, of, one of us, not both of us, one of us would act as an advocate for the senior um, and would really kind of be there for them throughout the process in whatever capacity 
that they want. So this could range from little to no involvement, which is perfectly fine if that's what they want, what they need. Um, but if they don't have any supports, um, you know, Shannon or I could be that support for them, attend the meetings with them, debrief with them over the phone after meetings, and also advocate for their voice to be heard throughout this whole process. Um, and we can also advocate for seniors' needs throughout the meetings, helping with things like transportation, interpretation services, other needs that would make the seniors' involvement possible and a lot more comfortable. Um, and then, of course, throughout the meetings, um, Carrie, you know, we do, we do so many things and we have so many contacts so we can provide referrals to other departments to carry, um, you know, use resources in our victim advocacy program, uh, like VCAP, Victims Compensation. Um, you know, we can help with fixing a door or a window that might have been broken from the incident that occurred. And then even further, you know, we can provide referrals to other agencies and organizations in Philly, depending on the seniors' needs. All right, so I'm going to go to the next slide now to talk just a little bit more about kind of characteristics of cases um, that make sense for RJ. So for the most part, we're going kind of case by case um, for referrals for the program. The only instance um, or case that wouldn't really be appropriate for restorative justice would be if the victim is experiencing um, a kind of abuse from the offending party where it wouldn't be safe for the victim and the other party or parties to be in one of those meetings or in the same room together. Um, but as you heard a few slides earlier, there are a few different types of restorative justice. So there are ways to do, um, you know, to do RJ that don't involve um, the offending party if it's not safe for them to be in the same room. Um, so yeah, we don't want to further uh, perpetuate a dangerous environment for the victim, put them in a situation that would not be safe for them. Um, so if we know and are aware that a victim is experiencing patterns um, of abuse or if there is like particularly a power and control dynamic between participating parties, we'd want to screen for this, safety plan when appropriate, um, you know, figure out which, you know, which RJ process is the safest one and then, um, you know, if need be, potentially refer the victim to a higher level of care and resources. Um, so for the RJ process itself to be facilitated, the victim does need to be willing and wanting to address the harm that has happened. Um, they also have to be ready to meet with the other party involved to discuss the harm and the hurt that's happened. Um, and another part of this, and this is huge, um, is that they will not, that they don't want punishment for the offending party or parties. And this is something that I, I've been learning from doing victim advocacy. Um, you know, the victim really needs to be centered and what their needs are needs to be centered. So if they are really wanting more, um, you know, to participate in that more traditional, um, more punitive system, you know, that's what they need and they need to be empowered. But if they do want something different, fabulous, we've got the program for them. Um, so I think it's really, that part of it is really just like really listening to what the, what the victim needs. Um, yeah, so you know, as we mentioned earlier, the, this is an extension um, of our victim advocacy program at Cary, and part of that is meeting victims at criminal justice centers that are currently pursuing legal matters against the defendant and want a sentence or, um, or punishment for this offender. Um, but yeah, there were some, some times that we were meeting um, with victims, and I think particularly in situations where it's a family member or maybe a caregiver, or a loved one, they don't want punishment. Um, they wanted the behavior to stop and for their loved ones to get help. So yeah, situations like that are where it's useful. Um, but I think it really is about listening truly to what the victim, victim wants and kind of what, how they're oriented. Um, yeah, so this brings me to my next point um, where the offending party of the defendant or the defendant um, has to be willing to participate um, and also to some degree take responsibility and accountability for the harm that they caused. Um, so the principles of restorative justice is focused around healing and accountability, um, like Sue talked about earlier. So we want the offending party or parties to be aware of this and willing to take responsibility for what's happened in the relationship. And that's something, you know, it sometimes seems maybe that like restorative justice is, you know, a way for someone who caused harm to get off easy, but it is not getting off easy. It is, there's so much emotional work that goes into really owning what happened um, and, and becoming accountable to the problem and working on healing for, you know, themselves and for other people involved. 
Um, yeah, so we have some examples of where RJ practices would be appropriate. Um, so it would be, you know, beneficial for family relationships or family disagreements that are going on, theft and financial issues, guardianship is a big one, or, you know, working to address issues before guardianship comes up. Um, also caregiving, long-term care issues, and, um, you know, a family can sit down in a circle setting or family group conference setting to discuss the care for an older, for their older adult family member and come to agreements with how to move forward as a unit. Um, so, yeah, and doing this gives the older adult a voice in their own caregiving or long-term care plan, and that's so important as well. The empowerment piece of that is huge for Carrie, um, and it's a huge part of what restorative justice is. Um, so finally, you know, housing, neighborhood conflicts, this is where maybe a circle can come into play as well, um, as a whole community comes together to discuss a harmful event, to heal, move forward, and to live safely in their own neighborhood. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about uh, referrals, um, we're currently taking referrals at maximum capacity, so feel free to reach out to Shannon or I through email um, or by phone. The phone numbers will be in the next slide. Uh, so, yeah, if you come across a potential referral, even if you're not really sure, um, definitely contact us. We're happy to talk about it. We're happy to figure out what could make sense. Um, and also, I just want to mention that even through COVID-19, Good Shepherd is facilitating meetings over the phone or through video chat um, if it's possible to do this for all parties involved. Um, so we can still provide the service now, even though this is really just a time of having to do things totally different. We're definitely able and willing to adapt to that. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of the end of what I have to say with that. Um, so I can turn it over to Marielle right now. Um, if if Marielle, if you want to talk a little bit more about Q and A, um, or if we want to talk about a little bit more about what restorative justice is, anything like that, I'll turn it over to Marielle to facilitate that. Thanks, Katie. Um, I think that we could, um, we're just going to, we have a, I just wanted to make a couple, one point is that um, I think there's a con sometimes a concern, and I can see where an aging professional may point out um, when they present the idea of potentially going through this process with um, an older adult, is the older adult responsible to have to get the potential of that offending party um, to agree to this process. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, our concern is, so that's more the role for Good Shepherd. They would do that with their, with their preparation because they have preparation meetings with um, the, the victim. And then they have prefer, preparation um, meetings for the, um, the person who had caused harm and other fa or other family members who need to. So I know that sometimes in the past when I've referred mediation or potentially restorative justice, um, I, I think some older adults may, would ask me, well, I'm not sure if this person would agree to do it. Um, and I'm not sure if I want to take that responsibility on. And I would just say to them that what, what our service is more here for is for that, that older adult the victim who had been harmed and guide them through this process um, and to see if potential, and then the Good Shepherd could help with the pre-meeting um, before any potential facilitation. And, there's, and as Katie had mentioned, there's other things that can come up. Um, we know that harm doesn't necessarily happen in a vacuum per se. There's other factors that uh, at least carry is very good for good to do in terms of we're very collaborative and the advocates are very resourceful in reaching out to try to assist for to individuals to help with um, with other needs that they may have because those do come up. Um, so I just want to get so that was just one of the things that I wanted to add. Um, one of the questions that we had, and please, if I, as I said before, if you have any questions, please just put them through to your chat box, to the chat box here in um, the lower left-hand corner is, um, can, this, can it be outside of Philadelphia? So as of right now with our program, PAVE itself, 
PAVE assists individuals who have the grant limits that we either the basically the crime had happened in Philadelphia, but the person doesn't have to live in Philadelphia. So we've assisted individuals who lived in the neighboring five counties, sometimes from other states, um, where the, the harm, the crime had, um, had occurred in Philadelphia, but for a, a many reasons that person is either, like they said, they were never even living in Philadelphia in the first place, or they were, or they have moved since then. So those, that would be the restriction. Um, so unfortunately, if the crime, had, you know, if something like this was in another county, and they reside in another county, we, um, our grant uh, has limitations, and um, that's where it's just that. But um, so if I would say Good Shepherd services in general serve the um, outside of Philadelphia as well. Yes, that's correct. I mean, you, you, yes, we are, although we're located in Philadelphia, um, what we used to always say was if you were willing to come to us, <laughs> we would serve you, but obviously um, that's not the way things are working right now. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're interested in our services and you're willing to participate by conference call or or um, Zoom uh, meeting, um, we are you know just contact us directly. What I would say though is for some of these, um, we have a. I guess what I should say is outside of this program. Um, our, we offer our services on a sliding scale basis. We don't turn anyone away based on inability to pay, but we do ask for um, a contribution. And it sort of depends on the specific case and the number of people involved and you know, just the overall situation. We're not gonna turn cases away for inability to pay. Um, but if it becomes clear that, that there are lots of resources available, you know, financial resources available, um, we, we do sometimes ask for a contribution. Um, and part of the reason for that is that these processes, as, as Marielle sort of um, pointed out, we do, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. For the, the actual facilitated meetings themselves can take, you know, at least a couple of hours and sometimes quite a bit longer. Sometimes there are several more. And that's not including all of the preparation that goes into it in, in, to begin with. Um, we, like to, we like to talk to every person who's going to participate before the actual meeting occurs so that we have some understanding of, you know, their their perspective and also so that we can make sure that they have a good understanding of what to expect in the in the meeting um, and also in talking we don't like when we initially talk to either someone who's been referred from Carrie or someone who just calls our office we don't determine the type of process that we're going to use immediately. And quite often it requires us to talk to, you know, at least a couple of people who are involved in the process before, I mean, who are involved in the situation before we can determine which process we're going to use. Um, so like I said, there's, there's a lot of preparation that, that goes into it. Um, yeah. I'm going to stop there and see. I'm going to put myself back on mute and turn it back over <laughs> to you, Mariel. Okay, thanks, Sue. Okay. So I just at least wanted to share, um, since uh, I encourage you, if um, uh, we do have our contact information as I uh, on this slide here, and as I said, uh, I will be sending out this recording um, within the next day or so, and just really appreciate everyone who um, were patient during our technical difficulties earlier before we got this off the ground. But we're really excited about this uh, 
program, I think it, I think as you heard from our speakers today, it could be sort of an alternative for those older adults that we work with that um, a, type, a form of abuse had occurred and they are looking to try and come up with some resolution together with potentially either that caregiver, that family member, that neighbor, whomever had caused that harm. And um, this could potentially be a way of going about that. Um, I know that for myself, um, through my career, when uh, hearing when this sort of program came to be, I thought of uh, a number of people, older adults that I worked with in the past and thought, wow, if something like this was available potentially to me to refer to, um, I, I wish this was like a, a tool or a resource I could have used. So um, we're excited to share this with you. And as um, you know, Katie and Sue had said that just because we are doing our work remotely, there still is opportunity to um, work with seniors and who um, have been victimized and and as I said even if you have um, questions down the road about the program feel free to reach out to one of us here um, we're happy to try to address that or if you think that you may have um, a potential referral we're happy to talk that through with you as well um, just because we, as I said, sometimes I know that, I mean, as, as myself, I've refer, I've been unsure about potential referral, and it actually turns out to be um, something very appropriate. So I definitely encourage you to reach out to, to one of us to do that. So um, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. Again, thank you for your patience. Um, and please be safe, stay well, and um, we'll get this information out to you very soon, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.